This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Ting. Anyway, hope you don't get cut off the internet. Right, I don't want that. What would your last communication on the internet be? If I was before I was cut off, or just in general? Yeah, like, well, obviously before. Your, your last dying words on the internet, your tweet, 140 characters before, plus, 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 no carrier. That's a good question. Um, would probably have to be, try the soup. Try the soup. Try the soup. Okay, not like hack the planet. Nah. Try the soup. Yeah. They're trashing our rights. Nah, nah I'm over that. <laughs> nice. All right. <laughs> so, um, so, so tell me, you are not war driving right. because that was ten years ago. Right. You're war dialing like it's 1985. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yep, early 80s. And um, well, actually, before we get into that, when did you first start war dialing? About that time, uh, it would have been a 1200 baud modem, and um, well, we had. We had some trash 80s, and we had, my dad even had an Altair at the house for a while, but that was, you know, obviously predating modems. Yeah, it would have been, probably been the um, BBS days. And and what for those that aren't familiar, for the like, you know, the youngins in the crowd that may not remember war dialing, what is that in a nutshell? So, in a nutshell, you're using a computer to programmatically dial numbers, a string of numbers, sometimes in sequence, or out, looking for other systems, carriers. Um, could be something like another computer, a remote access terminal, could be an HVAC system, some heating, or some SCADA, I guess is the new buzzword. Um, but basically, you're just trying to reach out and touch something. You're fumbling around in the dark until you find something interesting to mess with. Maybe it's even uh, that, that cool BBS that's got all the wares. Exactly. That's usually what it was about, was trying to find the wares or uh, try to find ways to, to loop into other systems, like um, an X25 dial-in that might get you into a different network that you would not normally be able to access because it's not over IP now. But the internet killed the BBS, so what computers are still connected to dial-up other than your grandmother who's still using AOL? That's a good question. So there's actually um, there's a lot of systems still on there. Most of them aren't internet access uh, tend to be like you know high availability or redundant systems like if you have a, a Cisco edge router or something that you need to be able to get into if the network goes down then you dial up a modem and have another oh, means to get into it. Because in that case it's out of band it's not connecting it to it through the internet you go through the plain, plain old telephone system. Correct so uh, yeah essentially you'd be able to still get in uh, without having to rely on IP. And so basically what you're saying is that now that all of the bulletin board systems are not using telephone lines anymore all that's left on the phone's network for modems to be connected to are interesting things. Generally speaking, yeah. So there are actually still about 50 or so dial-up BBSs that are still around in the U.S. and Canada, and there's a lot of stuff overseas. But um, for the most part, you're, you're looking at a lot of interesting things like uh, uh, Cisco switches that we talked about or telephone company switches, not networking switches, but that actually handle call and route management. There's a lot of payphones. A lot of the COCOT customer-owned payphones have modems that you can use to uh, service from the field. Um, what else is there? Uh, various... Uh, electronics monitoring stations, that type of thing. I found a radio station, um, power power management. Yeah, I know for sure that uh, when I was looking at this kind of solution, like, oh, the server goes down, how do you reboot it? Well, you can't SSH in because it's down, obviously. So they, they have these little boxes that are totally cheap, too. You just plug them into a, a analog line, mm -hmm. and then you just dial that number, boop, boop, reboot the modem, yep. or reboot the, uh, the computer. Right, exactly. Um, and so and another interesting thing about uh, dial-up is that uh, it's kind of fallen out of favor for data exfiltration. So if you're on a, a penetration test or if you're a bad guy uh, and you, you want a way to exfiltrate data that maybe goes around their, um, their digital loss system, then you just go over the phone lines and it's likely to not be noticed. You know, there's no, there's, there's no uh, intrusion detection system anymore that's going to detect exfil over uh, analog. Yeah, there's no firewall or IDS that's like checking the packets that are going through because they're like, oh, it's a modem connection, whatever. Right, exactly. It's uh, it's not that it's not possible. It's just that nobody thinks that it's still being done, so they don't they don't tend to look for it anymore. So the stuff that you find is it really like legacy gear in large corporations where they forgot they even have it or, yeah. or what? A, a lot of cases, you see a lot of mainframes, uh, AS four hundreds, um, that type of thing, um, and you see a lot of. Um, just random systems that, you know, the person who installed it is either dead or long since fired or retired and living fat and happy at the beach. So what are you war dialing now? Uh, what systems am I war dialing? So right now, like this week, I'm looking around suburbia because uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff that's in corporate America, 
but I'm kind of interested to see what are people that are still doing this, still using modems doing in residential ranges. And so this week I've dialed about 5,000 numbers, and of the 5,000 I found about 20 carriers. Most of them tend to be um, like PC Anywhere type systems, so you actually can do a, a dial-up connection to an RDP session remote desktop and control your computer that way. I mean, it's it's super slow. Wow. It's crazy slow, but you know, if you need to get in, you need to get in. So, I mean, that, that sounds reliable. And again, like we're saying, like you fall back out of band, use the phone network. Exactly. Uh, that's fantastic. I didn't even know that PC Anywhere w ran over modems. Uh, so wh why did you choose to do residential rather than corporate where you would find the mainframes and whatnot? Um, Probably because when I was a kid, I was really interested in looking at telephone company switches, and I was very interested in our local central office in town, and so that was something that I always meant to get around to and, and never actually did. Not to say that I won't be looking at uh, corporate, I just, you see a lot of Cisco switches and a lot of boring stuff in, in corporate America, so I'm really interested in finding like the gems, the legacy stuff. You want to find that ESS5 or that DMS100. Right. Exactly, and yes, and I've been, look, the, the exchange that I'm working on right now is a DMS100. No yeah. Um, and what was I going to say? Ah, it'll come back to well, me. Well, how are you dialing into any of these anyway? So right now I'm using a, um, a cable provider that has a unit that is essentially a voice over IP, but it's got low enough latency and uh, it's, it's a good enough signal that allows me to dial over the cable, over coaxial. And right now I'm using a combination of Windows, uh, it's, it's a Telesweep, and I'm using iWar for Linux, written by Debeef from Telefreak. That is so crazy to think that there are still war driving applications out there. Yeah, there's a few. Uh, I think that uh, THC scan is still being actively developed by the Hacker's Choice out in, I think, I believe Germany. Um, and then iWar hasn't been touched since 2007, but it still works really well. And it's got support for IAX voice over IP modems, so you can do some other cool things. Uh, so, so when you do, um, and I mean dialing, not driving, but when you do war dialing over, um, over a VoIP line, and then you do, <laughs> you, you're now going analog though, and then that analog is going back to digital. It's it's digital to analog to digital. It sounds horrible. What kind of BPS are you getting? So, uh, good question. Uh, we're using standard like SIP or IAX at home uh, homegrown. I'm getting lousy speeds at like 9600. But using uh, my local cable provider, I'm actually able to get full um, 56k connections. Nice. And so the obvious question is, if you've dialed 5,000 phone numbers and there's only maybe 50 um, modems out there. What were the other 4,900 calls like? Um, I was assume there's a lot of grumpy people answering the phone and having uh, a modem screaming in their ear. Um, but so what I tried to do is be a gentleman about it, and I would only dial between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. So that way I figured that most people would be at work or one quick call is not going to be a big deal, as opposed to in the middle of the night where we used to do it because yeah, we our parents would we bust our us. parents to know, exactly. And so then you're dialing 5,000 numbers in the middle of the night and you're yeah. waking up an entire city. Um, so it just seemed like a, a gentlemanly thing to do. And then you're dialing them sequentially and then the phone company finds out and then you get in trouble with your parents right. and don't do that. Yeah, definitely try to randomize it. So are you randomizing that? I am, yeah. So what I'll do is I'll typically scan in blocks of 99, not quite 100 because I'm still trying to stay under that threshold. And also I'll scan 99 uh, in a range and it'll bounce around within that range. And then after that scan's completed, then the next 100 within that range. So it's still uh, somewhat predictable. There's relatively low entropy in the numbers that I'm dialing, but I'm trying to keep it civil so that I don't get cut off from my phone company. And so is it one of these like services that are like unlimited nationwide calling? Yep. So are you doing your local exchange or are you venturing outside the country now that we have, I mean, remember it was all about free long distance right. in the 80s and 90s with phone it's freaking and now, yeah, now long distance is like they can't give it away fast enough. So, uh, so where are you, you dialing? You want to talk about uh, the town that you're upsetting? Uh, right now it's a, a small town in San Diego where I grew up. Uh, I don't want to disclose too much about it for operational security. Um, but I'm looking at other areas too and then for work, which is what started me on this tangent was I do a lot of things for work that are within the, the continental United States. Um, but you can use voice over IP and get um, through a analog telephone adapter, you can get dial tone in another country. And um, the Beeve and Jay Falcon did an awesome talk at DEF CON a couple years ago on um, hacking foreign networks over voice over IP. And I believe they found a Cisco dial up to the Kremlin yeah, you know, like they just boop, dropped them right into a, a Cisco switch. <laughs> that is wicked. So actually, it's got me noodling just right now thinking about like how 
Uh, you, you say you're using like a cable provider, but couldn't you just as easily fire up Asterisk and get a cheap sis, uh, SIP provider who probably wouldn't care what you're dialing because they're just wholesale selling you phone calls anyway? Right. So it, it depends on how much you want to spend. I mean, if you want to keep it minimal, um, you can use an Asterisk type setup, but you're still going to be paying for dial tone for the most part. Uh, unless you want to like commit to you know X number of dollars a month and you're looking at about two cents a minute. Um, the billing there can be a little bit more advantageous for the hobbyist because only if the call supervises are they going to actually charge you. So if you call a number and nobody answers, you're not going to get charged for that. But if something does answer, then you're going to be paying and they're going to round up to the nearest minutes. But we're still talking pennies on the dollar. And so what's the strangest thing you've found so far? Um, that's interesting. So there was a proprietary protocol connecting to a mainframe that used EDI, electronic data interchange, and it was a, a schema that this organization had modified for their own particular uses. Um, and that one that one kind of threw me for a loop for a bit when I found it. I didn't know what it was. Um, dialing the modem, it would answer, it would connect, and I would see it, uh, and then it would just hang out for 30 seconds. And if I didn't send it the secret password uh, or the key sequence to nudge the system into responding, it would just boot you. So that was kind of what got me on this tangent and um, it's probably the most interesting. Um, but it, it opened up my eyes to realize that most of the modems that I'm seeing nowadays don't respond with standard banners. So in the old days, you would hit the enter key a couple times or return and uh, it would uh, it would spit out a login prompt. But nowadays, they've, companies are starting to get wise to that. And so rather than just hitting enter a couple times, you need to initiate the handshake, handshake properly before it'll actually let you do anything. So now you're talking about you know potentially thousands of types of systems that you're going to have to manually go and through and figure out. So one of the, some of the things that I've been doing are trying to create a limited framework to to sort of incorporate these nudge strings that are beyond the simple you know carriage return a couple times, um, and then using a combination of when you find a carrier, do a caller ID lookup, and uh, you can do that for like a penny a lookup now uh, over the internet. So I have a quick little bash script where I just type type in the number, it it checks it and spits out who the name's registered to. And so now you've got this number. Well, now you've got a name associated with it. Well, now it's, you know, it's Acme Tire Company. Okay, all right, well, now they're in the automotive industry. So that sort of narrows the field of the possibilities of the types of things that they're going to be running. That less likely to be running a mainframe, more likely to be running maybe uh, something that monitors the tire pressure machine in the garage or something. <laughs> That's awesome. It's just so cool. It just warms my heart to hear this kind of stuff again. Um, are you publishing your research after this talk? Uh, yeah, probably. I know that the slides will be made available, um, and one of these days I'll stop being lazy and actually put up some code on GitHub. But I'll, I mean, honestly, the stuff that I'm doing is it's so uh, it's it's their parlor tricks, and it's not like code, right? It's a bash script here and there, or you know, just a, a config file. So I'll probably at least uh, put a blog together. Yeah. But it's you know, I'm just trying to get people thinking about it. Yeah, I think there's something really valuable in saying like, hey, remember that thing that we used to do that worked that everybody forgot about because we all moved on to the other things? The new this, they still, Yeah, they still work. That's awesome. It's a real pleasure. Sir? Thank you, Senior Jeffy Pop. Thank you. You've probably heard me raving about Ting over the past few months, and I'm so happy to say that a lot of Hack5 viewers have already taken advantage of their awesome customer-first approach to the whole cell market. If you guys don't know, Ting is a new service that brings clarity, usability, and huge savings to mobile phone users. And it's just because of one simple plan. You don't have to think about anything. It's really just honest pricing. Megabytes, minutes, text messages, they're all billed separately. So, you know, if you use more, then you just pay for the next tier. There's no ridiculous overage fees. And if you use less, well, you credited the difference. There's no BS. You just, you know, pay for what you use. It's so awesome. It's kind of like, one of those mind blowing, like, why doesn't everybody do that? Well, Ting does it and you can get yourself, uh, you know, you can actually try out their online savings calculator to see how much you could save over at hack5.ting.com. And if you sign up, uh, they're gonna go ahead and hook you guys up because they're huge Hack5 fans, $75 off your first month of service for just being a Hack5 viewer. So again, that's hack5.ting.com. It tickles me pink to see pink. Pink. Is that what it is, really? <laughs> tickles, tickles me, me orange because it's orange. Halloween. Yeah. yeah. Tickles me orange to, to hear about the board dialing. It's like, yeah. dude. That was hilarious. I loved it. Well, I mean, I used to do that. 
Yeah. Like on my modem, and then I'd get like, you know, I'd, my mom would pick up the phone in the middle of the night and hear modem sounds, and then I'd get in trouble. And <laughs> it was just like so cool That's to so see cute. <laughs> that being done still. And like the whole idea of like, oh, well, the box said, uh, you know, got to check the box that says we didn't put the SCADA system on the internet, so uh, we just put it on a modem. <laughs> Yeah, I love oh, that. Oh, that's cute. Yes. Well, yeah, that was an awesome interview. And we have our Technolist photo of the week. What did we get in this week? This one comes from Michael, who says that he owns a computer repair custom building shop over at uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, specializing in high-performance gaming rigs, which is really cool. But, dude, I totally want to build my own gaming rig. And he also does workstations, and he thought that he would share with us some of his own Technolist, I which is I love this. When was the last time you built a computer? It's been a long, long time. I thought it's you just built a new one when you moved into the new place. Yeah, I did. That was like two years ago almost. So it's time for a new one. Yeah, you haven't been here two years. It was February. In February, I will. Oh, okay. I will have been in February. You know what happens so. in February? What? Sim City, the new Sim City. Oh my I'm god! So about the new Sim City. Oh my god! Um, I know that's kind of like not really my like <laughs> biggest happiest genre. I love the FPS. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I know, you know how you FPS are with dog, your Sim right? City. Like boom headshot, but um. I am so excited about the SimCity because it's it's the one for me. That's that's exciting. That's so like how I get with Maybe Zelda. I'll build a new rig just for that, seriously. You could. You know, it's a great excuse. And then you could build it on the show. In fact, what's your excuse? We want to know what is your excuse to build an awesome rig. Uh, hit us up, <laughs> feedback at hack5.org. In fact, if you've got wicked rigs, um, that's where you can send a picture of them. Yes. Uh, feedback at hack5.org, technology photo in the subject line. We'll find it. Bam, just like that. Yes. Now it's time for this week's trivia. So last week's trivia question was, why did the A-Open AX4B533 tube motherboard contain a vacuum tube? Why? And the answer was to introduce a warm analog tone to the onboard audio. Mm, those warm analog those tones. Those warm tones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This week's question is, who is widely recognized as the most influential female game designer in history for her work on Sierra Online's series of adventure games? You can answer over at hack5.org slash trivia for your chance to win some awesome Hack 5 swag. Also keep in mind, we value your feedback, so hit us up feedback at hack5.org. Let us know what kind of technolust is up in your pants. Yes, and don't forget, you can always follow everything that we do over at hack5.org slash follow, and you'll find the links over there to social networks and everything that we are up to. And get yourself some technolust gear. If you want to support us directly, you guys know that we lovingly do what we call the hack shop, and that is where the gadgets that we put together and all those sorts MK of fun things yeah, can be found. <laughs> uh, and sometimes tricks and treats find their way into those packages. That's true. So stay tuned for that, hakshop.com. And thank you so much for your direct support for Hack 5. Yes, thank you so much. We truly appreciate it, and it helps us buy more beer. <laughs> With all that said, we're going to go buy some beer. And trick or treat. Yay! So <laughs> I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. Trust your tech <laughs> last. <laughs>